Hello and welcome to the second lecture for the Establishment Clause. And in this lecture, we're going to be taking a look at Establishment Clause controversies. So in this lecture, we're going to do a summary of the major Establishment Clause controversies. There are a lot of cases in the chapter, and I'm just going to try to summarize um, the general viewpoint of the court on these major controversies and then focus on a couple cases in this lecture. First, we're going to take a look at religion in public school, including prayer and also religious curriculum. Then we're going to turn our sights and we're going to look at religion in the public square. So in the public domain outside of public schools. Um, in particular, we're going to take a look at prayers in public meetings uh, and also religious displays like at the city hall or in other pu public uh, venues. Uh, and then we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit and we're going to look at the last case that's in the Establishment Clause section of Chapter 4, which looks at government involvement in religious affairs. So that's what we've got on the docket for the lecture. Let's get started. Now, when you were learning about the Lemon Test, uh, we referenced the school prayer case, or in this case, it was the Bible reading case, which was School District of Abington Township versus Shem. Uh, and so earlier in the text in chapter four, they talk about two prayer in school cases, Engels v. Vitali and the, the Shemp case. Okay. And so, uh, but later in the chapter, they go into more detail about the prayer in school controversy. Um, in Engels and in Shemp, they both rule, the court rules, that the government required prayer is unconstitutional, okay? Uh, in particular, because it is advancing a religious perspective. Um, as you know from reading in the textbook, these were really unpopular decisions by the court. Um, and one might think that given the sort of the public backlash um, to the prayer in school cases, that maybe the court might have um, uh, lowered that wall a little bit and been more supportive of a uh, state-sponsored prayer in public school. But that is not the case. Uh, we don't find a lot of consistency in Establishment Clause cases, but where we find consistency in Establishment Clause cases is uh, in prayer and curriculum in public schools. So the court has been very consistent in uh, prayer in public school cases. And this is just an overview of the three cases that your textbook talks about that shows sort of the um, the strong wall that the that the court has established between the uh, church and public schools. Okay, so there's a strong wall there. They talk about the case um, Wallace v. Jaffrey. So in Engels and in Shemp, we know that um, government required prayer is forbidden by the Establishment Clause. Um, but what about if the um, there is a, a state rule that says that there will be a daily a period of silence to start each school period? Um, there's no prayer going on, but that uh, that uh, that students are just supposed to sit in a uh, in a moment of silent silence and in that moment of silence I guess they could do whatever they want. Uh, this was based on an Alabama law that mandated a daily a period daily period of science in all public schools for meditation or voluntary prayer. The court found that that was an un that that law was unconstitutional. Uh, they found that uh, that the daily period of silence did not have a secular purpose, but instead it was um, it, that its objective was encouraging prayer. So no daily moments of silence. Uh, Lee versus Weissman is about a prayer at a graduation. And so you can read more about that in the textbook. This was about a, a state sponsored prayers, not in school, but at the, at the school's graduation. And they said prayer at, at graduation, that's unconstitutional. And in Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe in 2000, uh, this case puts an end to prayers that begin high school football games. And so this is about a Texas school district that had this longstanding process um, that they selected a student to start the 
the every football game with a prayer and the supreme court said nope that was unconstitutional uh so this court has been really really strict when it comes to prayer in public school okay so what about teaching religious religious principles in public school is does that violate the establishment clause According to the Supreme Court, again, we get this strong wall between church and state when it comes to public school curriculum that promotes religious doctrine or theology. Now, keep in mind that, um, you know, private schools can do whatever they want. I mean, obviously, a private religious school can promote and teach theology and religious principles. Uh, they, their curriculum, you know, you can have a, a class that's dedicated to learning what, you know, the, what it means to be a, a, a Methodist or a Baptist or, or, or a Jew. So that's allowed in the, in the private schools. So's prayer in the private schools. So here, just keep in mind, we're talking about public schools that are funded by taxpayer dollars. Um, and so just like with prayer, the curriculum uh, cannot, public school curriculum cannot promote a particular religious doctrine or theology. Now keep in mind that you can learn about religion in a specific context within public schools. Um, and so uh, that, <clears throat> that um, even, though the, even though the Supreme Court says that uh, curriculum that promotes religious doctrine is unconstitutional, you could take a history of religion class, you could take a philosophy of religion class. I used to teach a class called religion and politics, right? All of those are constitutional because those classes aren't promoting a particular religious doctrine or theology. Rather, it's a learning about different religion, religious uh, doctrines and beliefs and principles and practices. And that is does not violate the Establishment Clause. Um, but what does is, you know, where the, um, the state is trying to mandate the teaching of a particular religious perspective. And we see that come to the forefront in um, the teaching of creationism or intelligent design, which is sort of like an offshoot of creationism. It's sort of a rebranding of um, creationism. And so you'll read in your textbook about state that some states have passed laws that mandate either teaching creationism um, or that they mandate the um, uh, forbidding the teaching of evolution um, or they say that if you're going to teach evolution that you have to teach uh, creation science at the same time like a balanced um, uh, sort of approach to um, uh, learning about the origins of life. And that's what evolution and creationism are about, right? It's about trying to answer the question of where do humans come from, okay? So um, the court has found that the um, laws that mandate teaching creationism or intelligent design are unconstitutional. And so you'll read about three of those in your textbook. Uh, one case did not go to the Supreme Court, but you'll read about the, you know, the, if you've ever in high school, you might have put on the play Inherit the Wind. Uh, that, that's a famous, it's about the Scopes trial, which is based on a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that it's based on the, um, uh, a Tennessee law that forbids the uh, teaching of evolution in the classroom. Uh, it made it a crime in any uh, state university or public school for uh, an instructor to teach a theory or doctrine that mankind descended from a lower order of animals, okay? And so the, uh, in the lower level court, they ruled that that law was unconstitutional. Uh, that law gets picked up after the Scopes trial. Other um, states sort of pick up that law to challenge, uh, uh, you know, the, the ruling in the Scopes trial, particularly since it didn't make its way to the Supreme Court. And that's what happens in the case Epperson versus Arkansas. Uh, this is a 1968 case in which the court considers the constitutionality of a 1928 state law uh, in Tennessee. Again, it's the same kind of state law that was in the Scopes trial, that it makes it a crime to teach evolution, basically. Uh, and that the court found that that law was unconstitutional. Uh, and then, they, you know, you can read the uh, excerpt from Edwards v. Aguilard. 
in the um, in the textbook you could even consider doing your case brief on that um that coming out of apperson when they said that teaching that laws that criminalize the teaching of evolution are unconstitutional some states tried to get around that ruling and one of the ways they tried to get around that ruling was to um to say that that um if if the the public school science curriculum is teaching evolution that they have to give a bear a balanced and fair treatment to creation science and so the epperson uh the edwards v aguilar case uh, is about a louisiana law that enacts the evolution science in public school instruction act uh, and and that in that it basically says that if you're going to teach um, evolution you also have to teach creation science and the supreme court found that that balanced treatment for creation science act in louisiana was unconstitutional because it was promoting religious doctrine in the science classroom okay um, so that, you know, gives you a sense of where we do find some consistency in the Supreme Court as it relates to the Establishment Clause in public schools in particular. So prayer and religious curriculum in public schools is unconstitutional. Uh, but what about prayers to start Congress, uh, prayers to start legislative state legislative sessions? Or what about um, prayers to start town hall meetings or town council meetings? Are, do those violate the Establishment Clause? Uh, we get the answer, or uh, we begin to get an answer from the Supreme Court in the case Marsh versus Chambers. Um, Marsh, Marsh versus Chambers is a case about uh, the state of Nebraska. And the state of Nebraska had, opens each of its legislative se sessions uh, with uh, starts each of its legislative sessions with a prayer from a state-sponsored chaplain. And so the, they select a, um, a chaplain, and that person gets paid by the state. And then the chaplain, it's up to them to open the legislative session with a prayer. And so uh, the question comes to the Supreme Court about whether or not that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. Basically, taxpayer dollars are going to pay for a chaplain and then the chaplain starts the legislative session with a prayer uh, that seems like that would be a violation of the establishment clause particularly in light of the way that the supreme court has ruled in the uh the uh, prayer and public schools cases but that isn't that wasn't the outcome in marsh v chambers in march v chambers the supreme court uh, sat, found that praying before a legislative session is part of the fabric of our society. Uh, they actually didn't even use the lemon test in this case, but rather they um, kind of used original intent. You know, like when they, when the framers wrote the establishment clause, um, what did they mean by that? And they looked and said, hey, you know, legislative sessions of Congress have been starting with prayers since, you know, the 1700s, 1780s. And so they were doing that and they didn't view that as unconstitutional. So maybe the Establishment Clause doesn't really apply. Um, this isn't what the, the, the framers intended. Uh, and so uh, coming out of March v. Chambers, we find that at least for opening legislative sessions um, of the state legislature and also the United States Congress, uh, that that is constitutional and it does not violate the Establishment Clause. Um, but what about a, a, a local town council meeting? Uh, is there a difference between a, a legislative session where the people who attend that legislative session are lawmakers, right? And they're there at their, basically their workplace. Is there a difference between that and opening a legislative session that is geared towards lawmakers? Is there a difference between that and a town hall meeting where um, the city council members would attend, but also members of the public attend as, as well. So let's look at how the Supreme Court rules when examining opening town council meetings with a prayer. The question of starting a town hall meeting with a prayer comes to the Supreme Court in the case Town of Greece 
versus Galloway, and it's a relatively recent case from 2014. Uh, the picture there uh, is from two members of this interest group called Faith in Action. It's an accommodation interest group, and they um, submitted a, an amicus curiae brief to the Supreme Court because they wanted to uh, rule in favor of the town of Greece. Um, and then this is after the decision comes out, and they're happy because the they found this practice to be uh, uh, constitutional, opening the prayer, uh, a town council meeting with a prayer. Um, so the town of Greece is a, uh, a town outside of Rochester, New York, and that they uh, have monthly town board meetings. And they started this practice of starting each of the monthly meetings with a, a prayer. They, what they did was they would uh, invite members of the local clergy um, that there was actually no uh, policy. It just became, it was a practice. Um, but, uh, and so what the, what the town would do is that they would, um, reach out to, uh, the town employees would reach out to the local congregations and they would say, Hey, is there any volunteer? Does any one of your members of the clergy want to come and, um, give a prayer to open the meeting? Uh, the purpose of this, uh, practice was to invoke divine guidance as they were making decisions about the town of Greece and also to bring a solemnity to the uh, proceedings of the town council council any congregation was eligible anybody could come and do a prayer even atheists um, the clergy crafted the prayer the town didn't get involved in crafting the prayer uh, at all uh, now anybody could participate any congregation or person could participate but as it turns out, due to the makeup of the town, most of the prayers that were um, uh, 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 started at these meetings, they were very Christian prayers. They were not non-denominational. They were sectarian. Uh, they invoked Jesus and they invoked Christian, um, you know, principles in the prayer. And uh, Susan Galloway, uh, who was Jewish, and uh, a, 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 another person, Linda Stevens, who was an atheist, uh, they were attended these town hall meetings and they were just taken aback at how sectarian the prayers were. Um, they said they really objected to the reference to Christ and Jesus. And they felt like it was really, really difficult for them to sit through um, the prayers because they weren't, you know, members of the town council, but they were just there as citizens and they wanted to bring up issues about zoning or, you know, trash collection or whatever else. Uh, but they felt like they were really sort of coerced in listening to and sitting through these prayers in order to participate. Um, and so those are the facts of the case, uh, sort of the clash between um, members of the community who want to attend a town council meeting without having to listen to a prayer and this practice that the town of Greece has participated in for many years. So the question before the court uh, in the town of Greece versus Galloway is, does this prayer policy and practice violate the Establishment Clause? Uh, and in a really close decision, again, another 5-4 decision, um, the Supreme Court rules that no, this practice does not violate the Establishment Clause. Uh, and their reasoning is really heralds back and harks back to the Marsh case that we just learned about. They use Marsh as precedent. They say that there's a long history of this practice of starting um, uh, legislative and town council meetings with a prayer. Uh, the city was hands off in crafting the prayer. They didn't guide the clergy what uh, to say. And in fact, they said that, um, that in ensuring uh, that uh, the town didn't get involved, uh, that uh, making sure that the town didn't get involved and let the clergy themselves decide what they wanted to say actually made it less of a violation of the Establishment Clause because the state wasn't trying to get involved and make sure that the clergy were actually um, uh, producing non-sectarian um, uh, prayers. 
and, and so uh, they also said that local board meetings are not mandatory. They're not coercive, um, that you don't need to attend them, and maybe you can come in after the prayer starts. And so that was the basis of, of the ruling in the case. Uh, they also said that the audience for the prayer was not the public, but the audience for the prayer were, were the town council members. Um, there's a strong dissent that you can read in the town of uh, Greece versus Galloway, so you can help decide sort of which, um, which side you think makes the more persuasive case. Um, they said that a town hall is different than a legislative um, session. And so that while they may say that um, uh, Marsh is, a, is appropriate ruling for a legislative session, that the town hall is a different, um, that the town hall, uh, regular folks and regular citizens come to the town hall meeting um, and, they, and that uh, they're not there because it's their job, they're there because they're citizens. And so having citizens sit through that has a different effect and has a different impact in terms of the state's responsibility for making sure there's this separation of church and state. They were also really concerned that the pr prayer was way too sectarian, um, that um, you know, invoking Christ and, and invoking Christian principles, um, really they felt it violated the Establishment Clause. Uh, and they didn't say that um, town council meetings had to be a religious free zone, uh, but that it did need to be a, a, a non-sectarian zone so that you could invoke God or creator, um, but you couldn't um, uh, you know, invoke Yahweh or Jesus or uh, Buddha or Muhammad, okay? That, uh, that that was an, also a feature that the centers felt violated the Establishment Clause. Well, as is the magical um, uh, experiment that is the um, these United States of America, that coming out of the uh, Count of Greece versus Galloway opinion, um, that people sort of stepped up to the uh, the podium and said, "Hey, you know, if you're going to have, uh, if anyone's um, able to make and start town council meetings with a prayer, well, then um, anyone means anyone." So this is a uh, uh, the satanic prayer. The, the, the local satanic church in Pensacola, Florida, um, uh, that because of the decision in uh, the town of Greece case, uh, that the sent that, that town council meetings that you have to allow satanic worshipers to start uh, the, the town council meetings with a satanic prayer. Um, but when the foot was on the other shoe, people in Pensacola didn't like it. So as you say there, see there, there was a big uproar and people were screaming and shouting and they didn't want the, the Satanist to say his prayer, um, uh, but it was okay for Christians to say their prayer. So um, let's go establishment clause, <laughs> go America. All right, so the fun never stops with the establishment clause cases. Uh, the last thing we're going to look at before we look at the final case that we're going to be discussing is religious displays. Uh, and the general rule of thumb for religious displays in the public square is that uh, it's, it's usually a, a rule of thumb of that as long as the religious display is one of many other religions, religious displays, and also non-religious displays, as long as there's a plurality of representations at in the public square, then it does not violate the Establishment Clause. And it's oftentimes known as the reindeer rule um, because uh, that, you know, you can have a menorah next to the, the baby Jesus in the crash and then a reindeer and then like Frosty the Snowman and then we're all good. But if it's just a religious crash with Jesus in the manger or just a menorah, then that's going to violate the Establishment Clause. So the good old reindeer rule. Um, that comes from Lynch v. Donnelly, where crash scenes are okay, and the crash is the representation of the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph. Those are okay if they are part of a whole display with many views represented. Um, and so, again, the glory of the United States, that's where we get the festivist poles that are, that are brought down to in, enjoy the many views that are represented. Um, in Allegheny County, they said the physical setting is really key. Uh, if one religious icon is too prominent or too isolated, it violates the Establishment Clause. And so if you have a giant Jesus baby, but then just like a tiny reindeer, right? Um, and the Jesus figure is like right front and center by the 
public doors and then like the the reindeer or the menorah or whatever is like really far away into the corner uh, that's going to violate the establishment clause so the context and the physical setting is key um and you are going to be reading sorry about the dog but you're gonna you can read uh or do your case brief on van orden v perry which is a, a famous case about the placement of this big monument of the ten commandments in this 20 acre park um in texas and the court rules that that uh, that uh, that monument is allowed based on sort of what we just talked about, about where it's uh, the, the physical setting, that it's not too prominent and that it's a, um, that there's a diversity of viewpoints that are uh, presented at that park. So um, I want you to think critically about the uh, public schools versus public venues um, decisions of the Supreme Court. So the court erects a strong and tall wall between church um, and state and public schools, but not in other public venues, not in state legislatures, not in town council meetings, not in um, you know, the, the public square, uh, like the city hall. Uh, and the question is, is why? Why does the court have such a tall wall between church and state and public schools, but a lower, more porous wall in these other public venues? Well, some things to think about is the, the, the who is in public schools and who is in these other venues. Uh, children are in public schools and children are really impressionable. And so if you have a school teacher who or a, um, you know, a, a law that you start the day with the Bible reading, um, then children are very impressionable. They, they, they follow what their teachers say. They follow what other kids are doing, a particular younger children. Um, there's a power dynamics that's present as well, the teacher versus student power dynamics. Some people say, hey, why can't we have prayer in public schools? Because the, um, you know, the, 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 ch the kid could just leave the room and then come back in. They actually said that in the Shem case. But the Shem family said that's not really fair. For one, you have a teacher there, and so for getting up the gumption to leave the classroom um, while your teacher is up there, that takes a lot of guts, you know, and a lot of kids shouldn't have to be put in that position. And also the child going to stand out in the hallway, they get kind of separated out and they're seen as like the oddball atheist kid or whatever. And so the court wants to protect kids from that kind of co coercion. And then finally, the, 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 the court kind of views that religious indoctrination or uh, it, it, the not indoctrinating your kids in religion, right? That that is not the role of the state, but that's the role of the parent. And so you have a strong wall in public schools because that's something that should take place at home, not in the schools. Um, but as you get older and you're an adult and you go to a, you know, a state legislative or a Congress or, you know, a, a town hall meeting, uh, you're more developed, you're less impressionable, and maybe you're just like, don't really care about being considered the oddball atheist. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about is government involvement in religious affairs. Now, if you recall from Ever Everson, one of the things that um, Justice Black talks about in the Forbidden Territory um, is that states cannot participate in the affairs of, of, of the church, um, that the, the state can't dictate the membership of a church, um, the state can't help elect the or select the clergy of the church, um, they can't author church doctrine. You know, so a lot of times when I teach about same-sex marriage and um, students are like, well, uh, if same-sex marriage is legal before you know it, the government is going to be forcing, you know, ministers and priests to perform same-sex marriages. Well, no, 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 no. That would be a violation of the Establishment Clause, right? Because that would be the state telling the church what their theology is. And that's a clear violation of the Establishment Clause. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you when you think about um, religious uh, the government involvement in religious affairs, um, that, you know, most things with a, a the religion are are not subject to state um, controls, uh, mostly the things having to do with dictating membership and, and what they believe. However, the state is involved in many types of re regulation and oversight, uh, and uh, it, particularly when it comes to the public aspect of the church, okay? So churches are involved and houses of worship are involved in um, private theological endeavors, but 
um, they're also involved in public endeavors too. And we saw this in our discussion last week, right? Um, the Catholic Charities Service, they're involved in the public endeavor of providing foster care for kids, right? The public endeavor of food pantries, the public endeavor of, um, you know, having homeless shelters. And so the government does have an obligation to uh, regulate those kinds of public endeavors. Um, if you have a food pantry, it's going to have to be subject to certain food standards. Um, if you uh, if you are hiring people to work in the, your public endeavor to work in the food pantry or in the homeless shelter, um, that uh, that you know they're subject to anti discrimination laws because the state has an obligation to prevent that kind of discrimination. So the public activities of the church are subject to regulation. However, what about the internal activities, okay? Um, to what extent can the state um, uh, regulate the internal activities of the, of the church? They can't select their clergy, but what if um, uh, a church is discriminating against somebody who's actually one of their clergy member? Are they allowed to do that? Uh, and that question comes up in the, the, the next case. The question of, does the government have authority to tell the church how to conduct its internal business? So let's look at this final case. So this case is Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School versus the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. Um, and it's a case from 2012, and there is a picture of, again, some interest group people who are celebrating after the decision in this case. Uh, this is a really interesting case, and it deals with this concept called the ministerial exception. Um, so the, the Hosanna Tabor um, Lutheran School, it's a religious school, and it's a part of the Missouri Synod um, Lutheran Church, which is a conservative evangelical um, branch of the Lutheran Church. And uh, they offer Christ-centered education for the kids from kindergarten through eighth, eighth grade. Now, there are two types of teachers in this school. One of the type of teacher is called the lay teacher. And the lay teacher is um, just a, a, not a church member. Uh, they're there to, um, you know, teach in a, like a, a lay capacity, uh, that they are not uh, promoting religion or teaching religion. They might be there to teach arithmetic, math, whatever. So some student teachers are called lay teachers, um, but the other teachers are called, um, uh, are, are called called teachers. And um, the, the uh, called teachers get religious training and then they become basically ministers of religion within the school. So you've got your lay teachers and your called teachers. And the called teachers are like ministers of teaching the faith in the school. Now, this case revolves around a, a woman. Her name is Cheryl Parrish. And she starts as a lay teacher in the, in the Lutheran school. Um, and, but she becomes a called teacher in 2000. So she starts as a lay teacher in 1999 and a year later, then she gets trained up and she get, becomes a called teacher where she gets to basically be a religious minister in the school. Um, in 2004, she gets sick. She has this condition called narcolepsy where she can't control when she falls asleep, okay, which is probably not best for teaching in school. Um, she gets better from the disease um, and see, she, she, it takes about a year. And she says she's ready to come back in 2005 and, and start up her teaching position again. But the church disagrees. Um, they don't want her to be a teacher anymore. And they want her to resign. And in exchange, they're going to pay for her health insurance. But um, Cheryl Parrish refuses. Uh, she says that she is protected under the Americans with Disability Act. She has a disability and she can't be fired because of her disability. And they're firing her because of her disability. So she sues the school. Um, and so she sues, uh, she's fired, and she sues as a result of that. And then she files a suit with the EEOC, EEOC saying that the Americans with Disability Act has been violated. So what do you think about this case? Um, your textbook talks about like the argument in favor of the school is that the establishment clause prevents the government from appointing 
ministers in resolving religious conflicts or questions. And they're basically saying that, um, you know, Ms. Parrish is a minister and that because she's a minister and she is, you know, teaching religion, that they can make decisions about whether she's going to be hired or fired because it's like a decision that a church would make about hiring a clergy or firing a clergy. The government can't get involved in that. Um, but, you know, on the other side, the EEOC and Cheryl Pesch are saying that the government really has a compelling interest to end discrimination in the workplace. And this is a workplace and that all employers, including religious employers, should be prevented from um, firing somebody um, uh, uh, due to their uh, uh, medical condition and also in, in retaliation for bringing a suit uh, because that, you know, she says she's going to bring a suit and then she's fired and then she does bring a suit, right? So she feels like she's retaliated against that. And that um, that anti-discrimination laws are neutral, they're generally ap ap applicable, and that churches should um, have to abide by them. So what do you think? Do you think that Ms. Parrish was wrongly fired? Um, do you think that she's a minister or a teacher? Uh, and do you think that in this capacity, the Americans with Disability Act should apply to the actions of the church as it relates to a firing a teacher, even though this teacher may be um, a minister of religion? Let's see how the court rules. So the question before the court in Hosanna Tabor versus the EEOC is, does the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment bar employees wrongfully terminated from suing their employer for reinstatement and damages when the employer is a religious group and the employee is one of the group's ministers? And in a unanimous ruling, the court says yes, that the Establishment Clause bars an employee from suing. Um, they said that Parrish is a minister according to the church and both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause prohibit the government from interfering with the hiring and firing of ministers. The church gets to decide who they hire and fire. They can do it for whatever reason they want because they, they're, they're ministers. And so that, the, that prevents that employee from suing that religious institution for violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this is what's known as a reaffirmation of this notion of the ministerial exception, um, that churches have this exception, particularly when it comes to who they select for their clergy and the activities and the duties that the that clergy perform. Whoa! So we made it through both the free exercise clause last week and the establishment clause this week, and we're still standing, or are we? <laughs> so in conclusion, I just want you to think about, uh, after learning about the establishment clause, um, where do you sort of stand in terms of those three viewpoints we talked about at the beginning of the lecture one? Um, are you a separationist? Um, do you think that, that when, when you think about the separation of church and state, do you think there should be a strict separation of church and state, a solid wall between church and state? Do you consider yourself a separationist? Or are you not strict and you don't think that wall should be uh, tall, but it should be really low and quite porous? Um, that do you, are, are you a uh, accommodationist who basically like we says that interaction between church and state is okay as long as it's uh, the only thing that's prohibited is from the state or national government um, establishing a state or national religion? Or do you find yourself somewhere in between? View two that there should be a wall, but there should be some intermingling between church and state. The church and state can interact, but state can't fight favor one religion over another. So think about that as you are preparing for the midterm exam, um, which of those views seem to most closely align with your own personal position. All right, thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you again soon.